Whitmer's. Now, okay, so everyone knows in Michigan, uh, Whitmer, Governor Whitmer, what's her first name? Gretchen Whitmer may have gone a little overboard with some of her executive orders, both in terms of scope and duration. Um, and Okay, it's, it's complicated because there's two laws in there. There's the Emergency Management Act, and there is another one, which is the EMPA, which I always forget the acronym for. I took a picture of it. I'll, I'll get it while I while I ramble. The um, So Whitmer has been issuing uh, orders for a while now uh, that were uh, t seemingly timeless. The, it's the Emergency Powers of the Governor Act. So those are the two laws that are at issue. The EMA is, a, is the 1995 law. The EMPA, the Emergency Management Powers Act, is from 1945. Whitmer, setting aside the scope of the uh, executive orders that she was issuing, went well beyond the original time frame provided for in the Emergency Management Act, which was 30 days, I believe. It was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a fixed time limit. She basically says, well, I'm going to be issuing executive orders pretty much indefinitely, notwithstanding the terminology of the EMA, which says it has to be limited to 30 days, without going through the legislature, basically the executive now making the laws. Um, the court came down, you'll have to help me on this because I don't know why there's seven judges on a court of appeal coming out of the Supreme Court of Michigan. They come down and declare that the Emergency Management Act is unconstitutional uh, to the extent that any uh, order goes beyond the time frame in it. And you'll, you'll correct me if I'm getting this wrong. And they declare that the Emergency Management Powers Act um, split decision 4-3, what was it? It was, it was unconstitutional in that it delegated authority that it could not delegate to the executive. So if anybody doesn't know that there's a principle in law, I forget what it is, non, uh, delegatum non potus delega. So the yeah. person to whom you delegate non, power. Yeah, non-delegation doctrine in the States. Okay, so it's the person to whom you have delegated power cannot then delegate it back to somebody else. So... I'm going to I'm going to bring up the super chats while you tell me if I got that right or wrong and then help us understand this decision because it was it's it's 107 pages it's a beast I read the summary and then I skimmed through it but I, I think I got the essence which is emergency management act unconstitutional to the extent she's doing anything beyond the original 30 days that they could bypass the legislature and the emergency the EMPA um was had an issue of delegating power away from the legislative branch Correct. So the the Michigan uh, decision is a lot like the Wisconsin decision. Just took a little longer to get there. I sued Governor Witchmore, as I like to call her, uh, the early on in the case, federal civil rights case. But she, her people settled, and they gave my clients what they wanted. So that case didn't get to go further. But in the context of that, uh, the, we researched this issue. But the only real clear party that had standing to bring it was the legislature. The political context in Michigan is much like the political context in Wisconsin, where the governor is Democratic in both states, but the legislature is Republican in both states, and the Supreme Court has a 4-3 Republican edge in both states. Not surprisingly, it was a 4-3 split that ultimately determined her decision was unconstitutional in Michigan, just as it did in Wisconsin, but not because of any Bill of Rights issue. It was because we're supposed to have a tripartite division of government. The legislative branch is supposed to legislate. The executive branch execute and enforce the laws, not write the laws, not make the laws. And the all the there's various legislation over time. And some of the laws she was citing were from the 1940s. So they were designed for a wartime era um, where they gave the governor executive emergency powers to deal with a situation where basically she couldn't get something done through the legislature in time to address an emergency. That was the anticipation of all of these emergency laws. Some of these emergency laws that governors are citing go from the er to the early 1900s. And they were either in the context of massive plague outbreaks, you know, plague-like outbreaks, smallpox, yellow fever, that kind of thing. Or they were things like uh, wartime or severe rioting. So that's why you see them in the 1900s and teens. Then the next time you see these laws passed, the 1940s. Next time you see these laws passed are the 1960s to early 1970s. They mostly disappear from the books after that. And no governor had used the laws the way all of these governors are. So the legislature brought suit. In Michigan, they have a specialized procedure about where you can bring such a suit. You have to bring it in the Court of Claims of Michigan, where you don't have a jury trial right. The, the, the judge ultimately determined, a cra in my view, it was a crazy interpretation. She said the general statute applied rather than the specific statute applied. 
um, and didn't even really fully uh, reach the scope of constitutional questions that the Supreme Court did. But ultimately, it goes up to the Supreme Court, and they they agree on certain provisions, both sides. Uh, but the ultimate effectiveness on whether the orders were going to be unconstitutional was the part they disagreed on. But their point was a simple one. In America, if you have the executive branch doing the legislature's work, why even have a legislature? Why even have tripartite branches of government? Our administrative state on the federal level has gotten way out of control this way by Congress delegating to executive agencies to write their own laws. Uh, it creates a bureaucratic state that is immune from democratic checks. It's a... Uh, it, it is a certain kind of deep state. It's the administrative state, bureaucratic state. You put it in the law enforcement, national security context, then you get a deep state. But it's the same concept of a dual state that the economist uh, editor talked about at the end of 19th century that led to the idea of the deep state in its origin. It was just how can you have a government that's non-responsive to the public? And it's be by creating a, literally a dual state. One state step part of the state is democratically elected. One part is not. One part is responsive to democracy. One part is not. And that's what you're seeing on a massive scale. And it's just governors asserting, seeing the power that the administrative state has at the federal level and just embracing it wholesale in the name of an emergency here uh, and doing things that have never been done in our history before. And because they, they, all the judges come from a professional class that's all terrified because they follow institutional media like the New York Times going along with it. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, as we talked about from the very beginning of this, there's a long history of American courts abdicating their judicial supervisory role anytime anybody says the words crisis. Uh, so whether it's war, whether it's public health, whether it's riots, whatever it is, all they got to do is say crisis and the Constitution tends to vanish for at least the length of time of the crisis. The difference here is this crisis was no, no more nowhere near as severe as past ones that had legitimated such exercise of power and were going on much longer than those had uh, and, and to a much broader group of people. Like occasionally I'll get someone to say, well, you know, they they quarantined a whole neighborhood for six months during some yellow fever epidemic outbreak. That's true. But we've never quarantined the entire country before, the entire state before. We've never disavowed all of the constitutional protections for pretty much everybody before. This is all new. And uh, luckily, the a Republican appointed Supreme Court, uh, a Republican elected Supreme Court, uh, was willing and able to step in and say, no, this was not much. This was clearly unconstitutional because they had the backing of the Republican state legislature that was wanted to restrain the governor and the governor was ignoring their attempts to restrain her. It's it's an amazing thing, actually. I, I had I just did an interview or a, a bit which is going to air next week on uh, it's called K.R. Davidson's Canadian Justice. It's a television show or a news show where we were discussing the difference between the United States Supreme Court and our own and the United States system and our own. And it is the balance of power that you have in the states or, or what is supposed to be the tripartite system so that each section keeps the other in check but doesn't override the other is an amazing concept, which we don't really have in Canada. But when it runs, when it, when it gets out of balance, it gets out of balance. And you have... Basically, you, you've gone. You've, they've gone. What six months in Michigan without the legislature doing what it is they're supposed to do? And and what's the good reason? Why couldn't they do it at the same time? First of all, that is my question. Why couldn't they do this at the same time? What prevents them from having legislated five months ago? Oh, they tried. She just refuses to sign. So that that that's the problem. So that because she she's usurped their duties, and when they try to take him back, she says, "No, I won't sign the legislation," and they don't have veto proof majorities. So that that's effectively what happened. There was always a role for the executive in legislation, but it wasn't supposed to be initiating legislation. It was supposed to be either affirming or rejecting legislation from the legislature. That's what she just said. Screw you. I'm not going to do it. Same problem in Pennsylvania. The difference is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is Democratic, so they allowed him to do it. Uh, and it was the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decisions that the Third Circuit probably relied upon in issuing that stay of Stickman's order. And so... Um I just lost my thought. It's that's when is I mean, when is Whitmer up for for reelection? Not until 2022. And for the most part, because of the way the media has covered these things, governors that have imposed the strictest lockdowns have been politically rewarded in the polls. 
because it's, oh, look, they're doing something. They're doing something to protect us. That, that's been the mindset and the mentality. So one of the few Democratic governors that is up for re-election that has been under lockdown has been Cooper in North Carolina, highly likely to win re-election. So the, the, the way the media has portrayed this and people's fear-induced mindset, and this will always happen. I mean, Korematsu was a popular decision at the time. Jacobson was a popular decision at the time. Buck was a popular decision. All the horrendous violations of civil rights and civil liberties were usually popular. The court's job was to protect them when those protecting those rights was not popular. And unfortunately, they have a long, long history of absconding and uh, abandoning those rights protections precisely when people need them the most. As yeah. Earl Long once said, this guy came up to him and said, Earl, I always vote for you when you're right, but I can't vote for you when you're wrong. And Earl said, you dumb SOB, I don't need you when I'm right. Uh, and there was deep truth to that. I mean, it was Earl's, you know, Northern Louisiana way of putting it. But uh, the the truth, the same thing is we, we, the court was designed to be in most immune from democratic pressures. So it would take the unpopular decision to protect civil liberties. Unfortunately, historically, there's no evidence of that. It's and it's an amazing thing. I, again, I, I mean, I, I talk with people in the park. I talk with locals. When you get past the initial, everyone sort of feels that they have to project the same sort of uniform understanding and, and acceptance of the situation, but you get under it and it's like, yeah, what's, what's justifying these draconian measures? What are the numbers? What's, what's the actual threat and what are the actual consequences to justify these measures? And I'm reading Isaac Castillo's um, super chat. He says, did any, did anyone even, uh, did anyone catch Stephen Crowder's call for a FOIA request and call for everyone to FOIA governor, Whit governor Whitmore, actual death counts to dispute the funny numbers she used to justify her executive orders. That's the other thing is, you you know, in Canada, we're, we're under 10,000 fatalities it, per, per capita. It's, you know, it's a large number and it's not to undermine that number. Um, to explain it away, as I've, you know, mentioned in tweets and, and, and on certain videos, 90% of those deaths originated in or around long-term healthcare facilities. One of the reasons was by the time you get into lockdown, they were recycling staff among the long-term healthcare facility. So an infected staff member would go from one house to another talking about super spreaders. So you have these, these numbers, which whether or not you think they justify these measures in the first place is one thing, but then you have the actual cause of the problems, which have nothing or very little to do with the draconian, fundamentally unconstitutional measures being implemented. Um, and that's my rant. One question that I had though, why are there seven judges on this uh, Michigan court? Uh, most state Supreme Courts have seven judges. So the, the U.S. Supreme Court used to have seven. Then we added it to nine. Most state Supreme Courts have had seven throughout their history. Some vary. Some will only have five, but some will have nine. But most the state Supreme Courts only have seven. And in most states, the state Supreme Court is an elected position. Okay, interesting. So uh, 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 Allegan News says the case in Michigan was not brought through the Court of Claims, but was in response to federal court ruling judge, federal court judge asking state to answer questions in case brought by medical providers. The legislature, the legislature case had yet to be ruled on. Okay, very interesting because there was, the, we did a video, I think we did talk about the one that went through the state of claims. And I this, think this decision will apply to the legislature case as well. So now, uh, unlike in Pennsylvania, this decision. Uh, w was rendered by the, it's a substantive decision rendered by the Court of Appeal, effective immediately. I think the Attorney General, I have people sending me emails and I, and I don't know if I should mention them because maybe they don't want to be put on blast. So I well, thank you for whoever sent me the article, uh, sent me an article saying the Attorney General has said that we're not enforcing any of these measures, regardless of Whitmer saying they're in effect for the next 21 days. Um, you want to, I mean, I, I sort of understand it. You want to explain what she, what Whitmer is saying when she says, notwithstanding the judgment, everything is in effect. <laughs> like bounding on the table, you will respect my orders for the next 21 days. What does she mean by that? That she's literally just going to ignore the order that, uh, that, that the, she's risking contempt or anything else. And she's going to stick with the order, uh, rather than do it. And I you notice the time frame, uh, and it was, we're right on the eve of an election. So if, if Michigan unlocked and opened up the fear bunks, Democrats is that that will help Trump because it'll drive down unemployment and help him get reelected. So it's not a coincidence. She's willing to risk contempt of court just to try to keep Trump from winning Michigan. This is, this is mind. I, you know, I, I, it was when I started my channel, Peppermint, thank you very much. It was, it was the antithesis of, of politics. And when I started the law, I never thought it would be not, you know, fundamentally inextricably intertwined with the, with politics. This is so awfully political and there's no way to, there's no way to ignore it. Like it, mm -hmm. there's no way to ignore it that, that all, I would imagine also if the order is, lifted or declared unconstitutional people no, can get back to business um 
it will make her look like an idiot before the election and it will, it will potentially have a backlash of people voting just to vote, even though she's not on the ballot, to vote against her in principle and just go for Trump. Right. Yeah, I, I hadn't put that 21 days um, in in, uh, in context. And, uh, and the attorney general, now I'm wondering. I hadn't checked the attorney general's political affiliation. I do wonder. The attorney general says we're not going to prosecute for any of these issues. Now I'm wondering of what political Probably. persuasion is the AG. Probably a Republican. I don't know personally, but it would be, you know, yeah, that's usually 70, 80 percent right. That's amazing. We got Peppermint. Peppermint says, what happened to court TV? And do you think the lack of it is why crooked judges are getting away with so much? It's an, it's, that's an interesting thought, observation as well. There's two and different versions out there now. Dan Abrams established court TV. He has Law and Crime Network instead. And they actually still cover trials. It's just they're available on a wide range of streaming services. I don't think they're on any mainstream media. And then there's a bunch of court subscription services now. So you can watch some really interesting trials, but I think it's expensive. I mean, I, I subscribe to it because I can watch interesting cross-examinations, uh, direct examinations, opening, closing statements in big civil cases that otherwise don't get much attention, selective criminal cases. Um, I agree it's too bad we don't have Stickman in Nevada to uh, Trooper at FN 2525. The, uh, it's much better than Sissy Lack, who's continuing to close stuff down here. Golly, I hate that guy. But, uh, well, uh, in, in Quebec, you know, we, we've gotten to numbers which there's there's a spike when you're going from the new, what is the new goal? You know, at the beginning, it was don't overwhelm the hospitals. Now we're no longer anywhere near there, but the goal has moved. So now the, any, any spike on the new target uh, justifies code red for, uh, for Montreal and, and our various regions. It's it is, and I I forecast this from the very beginning. I told folks that what's going to happen is they're going to say that we have to have testing, and then they're going to use the testing results to justify all kinds of other provisions, even when there's no longer any correlation between mortality and hospitalization and the problem. And that's precisely what they did. It was always a scam from the get go. We do we never have done mass testing for flu like viruses ever. We didn't do it for Spanish flu. We didn't do it for Hong Kong flu. We didn't do it for Asian flu. We didn't do it for either swine flu. We've never done mass testing on this scale. It's it's still questionable about how reliable that testing is. More and more questions are raised by Alex Berenson and other people about that. Um, and But it was always intended to create, to first start off by pointing out when there's a very low numbers of tests, how high the mortality rate is, because you're not testing most people, terrify people into thinking that association is permanent rather than simply a product of low testing. Then when you dramatically increase the testing, pretend that rate is static when it isn't, uh, and the and just mislead people and scare people and terrify people into obedience. The, the worrisome thing for me is that, uh, as a constitutional civil rights guy, uh, is that the Milgram experiment works. All you do is put on a white lab coat and all the people that will never listen to a general and never listen to the police and never listen to a politician. Turns out they were just wearing the wrong outfit. Don't put on a general's uniform. Don't put on a politician suit. Don't put on a police uniform. Put on a white lab coat. And just like the Milgram experiment, watch people behave happily. 